and welcome to the first episode of Imbue Your Life. My name is Mary Bu, and I am your host for this journey. <laughs> um, our hope for this show is to highlight that which is positive, hopeful, sacred, and inspiring. The word imbue, it's a little known verb, which means to permeate, infuse, or inspire. And we hope to do just that, inspire you with conversations, practices, and ideas that we'll be featuring. Um, a little bit about me, and then I'll introduce our first guest. Um, I'm a lifelong musician, a yoga instructor, and a studio owner. I own a little yoga studio in South Minneapolis called Imbue Yoga, hence the name Imbue Your Life. <laughs> um, the music I write weaves um, psych my psychology bachelor degree, uh, poetry, dreams, the natural world, and it's sometimes kind of crass and has some so societal overtones um, and some of my weird sense of humor. I own this yoga studio, Imbue Yoga, and there are many styles of yoga there, about eight different instructors, and uh, maybe one day we'll take this show on the road and check it out. Um, tiny bit more about me, I have many interests, great lust for life, uh, and I'd like to give you a disclaimer that I'm not an angel and by no means claiming to be this spiritual guru or anything. <laughs> um, I have a lot of vices and as a musician, I feel like practicing yoga and playing music in bars really balances each other out. <laughs> um, but taking me out of the picture, the guests I plan to bring on this show and the topics and teachings we'll focus on are well beyond me and hopefully will bring benefit to your life things that we can do in our everyday to find bliss and a little more hope, because let's face it, we all could use a little more hope. Um, for our show today, since it's February, I'm, I'm not sure if this will come out by Valentine's Day, but I wanted to focus on love, compassion, and the divine feminine. Um, and again, we could all use more love in our lives. So with that, I invited one of my master yoga teachers, Miss Tara Cindy Sherman, to be my very first guest. I met Tara while at my 300 hour teacher training at the Yoga Center of Minneapolis. And um, I'm halfway through the training, pretty behind. I have a lot of work to do. <laughs> a little bit about Tara. Um, Tara received her first 200 hour yoga teacher certification at Expanding Light in Grass Valley, California back in 1993. She's been at it for a long time. And she's been teaching yoga ever since. That same year, she was initiated into the tantric form of meditation known as Kriya Yoga, as taught by Paramahansa Yogananda. I was not going to try and say that. <laughs> <laughs> so Tara is also certified in dance kinetics from Kripalu, Atma Yoga, Ashtanga with Doug Swenson, Yoga of the Heart, Cardiac and Cancer with Nishala Devi. Am I yeah. saying that right? Yep. Um, Jai Prenatal, Yin Yoga. Yogic Mystery School and a trip to India with Russell Paul studying Nada Yoga. Wow, so cool. Vinny Yoga with Gary Krafso and um, I'm assuming meditation with Sally yes. Kempton at Mount Madonna. Over the years, she brought together all of her favorite teachings and experiences into what she's named Radiant Shakti Flow, which incorporates the Hindu goddesses, ritual, mm -hmm. chanting, drumic, Drum, drumming, drumming yoga warm-ups, <laughs> creative movements, and yoga nidra for a full experience of the sacred. And that is what we will be chatting about mm -hmm. today. Hi, Tara. Hi, Mary. I'm so glad you're here. I am too. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here and honored to be your first guest. So Back at you. Thank Yay, you. we made it work. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to rattle off a bunch of questions okay. and we'll see what comes up from the ether. So I read that in your bio as a young woman, you had a few experiences that sort of inspired this spiritual path. Mm -hmm. um, one being reading Siddhar Siddhartha yes, and um, also gazing into the flame of a candle. Can you speak a little bit about your background and perhaps tell us some of the pivotal or juicy points that led to you developing your Shakti flow? Yes, absolutely. So, um, yes, I read Siddhartha. I had friends um, turn me on to that book when I was like 13. And it just made such an impression on me that I became a vegetarian. Awesome. And uh, as I said, I, I taught myself to meditate. I don't know if I taught myself, but I discovered meditation um, through the technique known as Trataka, staring into the flame of a candle. And so, um, and just trying to empty my mind. And I only stuck with it for about six months. 
But then about 15 years later, I came back to meditation. And that's how I became a yoga teacher. First was through the practice of meditation. And so in those early, when I returned to um, meditation, in those early days, I would just search the Half Price Bookstore and find all these treasures and gems. And numerous times I picked up the book, Autobiography of a Yogi by mm -hmm. Paramahansa Yogananda, and put it back. Something drew me to the book and something um, inside me made me put it back. Hmm. And so eventually I had a dream where I went into a used bookstore uh, in a woman's home. In this one room, the books went all the way to the ceiling, and I was just kind of in awe looking at the books and, you know, which one am I going to pick? And she reached up onto the shelf and pulled down a book and said, I have the book for you. And she handed it to me, and it was um, Autobiography of a Yogi. You know, I just bought that yesterday. Did you? Yeah. Are you oh my <laughs> I gosh. used to own it, and then I lost it. I moved, and, and I wow. just bought it yesterday. Synchronicity. I totally. Um, okay, I can't wait I to hear it. Yet, okay, yep. I can't wait to hear it when Amazing. you do. Yeah. yeah. So Yogananda appeared out of the, the book and told me to read the book and, and to learn the meditation. And so uh, I didn't go buy it the next day. But within a couple of weeks, I did and learned about the um, ancient form of meditation known as Kriya Yoga. And so I've been practicing that ever since. And that's what really put me on the path. And then through my meditation and my studies, I kept reading about yoga, 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 and finally um, started practicing an asana practice. Yeah. Wonderful. And then you studied all of these with all these great teachers and used it together into your own magical way. Um, so you and a few of your colleagues, Amita Stark and Coco Elwood, um, have begin to began to offer these retreats. And you and Amita do these, these Path of the Goddess retreats and immersions. Mm -hmm. And um, so I'm super interested in learning about what exactly the Path of the Goddess is in your vision and um, what are some of the things that you do. Okay, I'd retreats. love to tell you. Yeah. So that's my passion, the goddess, um, the feminine face of the divine. Early on in my um, studies, I was drawn to goddesses the world over of all different traditions and um, mythology, but the Hindu goddesses really spoke to me the most. And so um, I've been studying the goddess as long as I've been practicing yoga. And I met Amita at uh, Mount Madonna um, taking Well, I was taking a retreat um, with Sally Kempton, a meditation retreat, and Amita was there chanting for it. And we hit it off and come to find out she's from St. Paul and would come home uh, during the holidays to visit her family every year. So we just started connecting that way and doing kirtans together with Coco. And then the more we got together, the more our love of the goddess came out and we sort of brainstormed this whole Path of the Goddess. We just um, are getting near the end of our first six-month immersion with women studying the, diff the faces of the feminine in the divine the world over. And then um, we, for teacher training, we've got something coming up, Bhakti Shakti, that will focus more on the Hindu goddesses. And then Coco and I have done, worked together for many, many years and always bring the goddess in too. She's a shaman, so she does a lot of earth-based ritual, um, shamanic work along with yoga, and is a fan of the goddess, but then I'll always bring it in. So it's mantra, it's symbolism, it's mythology, it's ritual, it's relaxation, it's creative, uh, like sacred art, um, all those kind of things to empower um, women and men as well um, with the richness of this um, path. Wow. Yeah. That sounds amazing. I love it. I feel like it's my life's work, really. Oh, absolutely. Ooh, I can't wait to do it. <laughs> <laughs> and we will, yeah. too. Yeah. And side note for you Minnesota rockers, um, Coco was in the rock band Zuzu's Petals. Mm -hmm. She's pretty, pretty rad. Yes. Um, <laughs> so It's amazing. So yay, a path of the goddess. Um, so for the, the lay person, mm -hmm. um, can you... So we're looking at Lakshmi, yes, Hindu goddess. Mm -hmm. um, and some people might be like, what? This is pretty weird, right? <laughs> like, like, like Minnesota, like, oh, you know. Yeah. Um, so I wonder if you could help demystify, like, the deities and, like, you know, is this some sort of, like, you know, dark thing or is this, you know. Or a cult or yeah, something. Yeah, or a cult, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. um, 
because these seem suit these practices and ma uh, mantras and chanting might seem super foreign to mm -hmm. to some people. Yeah, yeah. So the um, the archetypes are explained as energy, forms of energy that exist in us and in the universe. And so when we do these practices, uh, and, we'll, and they seek to tell the story through symbolism, through myth, through um, sound, and um, eventually images. But first they came to the seers as, as forms of energy that they um, developed into mythology and then sound vibrations. So Lakshmi is the goddess, she's the golden goddess, she's the goddess of all good things, every type of blessing, whether it's spiritual or material. Um, she is to aid one with um, fertility, with love, with family, with goodness, um, abundance again. And yeah, so I mean, honestly, it's like we can work with these archetypal energies through images and through symbolism and through mantras, but we can also view them as, so we can view them as real on a different plane of existence, or we can just view them as mirrors that reflect parts of ourselves um, and energies that are already in us, either uh, awakened or latent or somewhere in between. So when we work with the goddess, it's helping us to align with an energy greater than ourselves, that which we seek to embody, and on the other hand, it's helping us realize that we're already connected and we just don't know it. So on the one hand, we can draw down energies that are greater than ourselves. On the other, we can just remove the veils that keep us from remembering um, these qualities, these energies that are in us and each other. That's mm -hmm. so beautiful. And I just love the imagery with a lot of these deities. Every single thing has a lot of meaning, mm -hmm. you know, the lotus and you know the jewels that she's wearing, and I'm sure like every single little symbol can be delved into and just expounded upon. Exactly, so that is yes. awesome. Um, kind of like dream analysis. You yes. know, maybe I'll have a guest come and talk about that someday. That but, would be cool. Mm -hmm, yeah, that's like one of my things. And me too. You had a big dream that yep. kind of opened up your path, so mm -hmm. that's pretty neat. Um, so in a little bit, well, we'll be talking about some of the symbols that we brought for our altar here that Tara yeah. brought, and, um, and we'll be eventually doing some chanting and um, singing a mantra. Um, can you talk a little bit about what mantras are and why they're helpful? Yes, I can. Great. So mantras are energy phrases, and there are three types of mantras that come to us from India. And the oldest are known as Shakti or Tantric mantras. And they're single seed syllables that encapsulate energy. And we can string those seed syllables together, one after the other, or we can chant them individually. And so they encapsulate the essence of nature, of our chakra system, of these energetic um, intelligences, the deities. Um, so the Shakti mantras are single seed syllables that are like time release capsules that we chant and again to connect with something greater than ourselves but also to um, remove the veils that keep us from experiencing that and knowing that so those are the oldest mantras then came the vedic mantras and those are more precise more complicated and a little harder to learn and the vedic mantras are really represent the macrocosm Many of them are prayers for peace and for healing and for the entire universe. Some of the Vedic mantras are attributed to deities, but many of them are simply prayers for peace. And so um, the Shakti mantras, the oldest, relate to the microcosm, and the Vedic mantras that came next relate to the macrocosm. Mm -hmm. And then we have the most recent form of uh, mantra, which is um, bhakti or kirtan, mm -hmm. call and response, devotional chanting. Mm -hmm. And what that often does, today we'll chant together, mm -hmm. but often there's a lead um, uh, person that does the call and then the group does the response. And that raises the energy and opens the heart. It's the path of love and devotion. And it really joins the micro and the macro together in that call and response. And so it actually was a re, um, sort of, I heard from one of my teachers when I went to India, 
um, that the Bhakti movement really was sort of a um, protest against the Vedic mantras at that time because only the Vedic male priests could chant those mantras. Wow. So um, around the time of the Bhagavad Gita came um, the uh, whole path of Bhakti and the Kirtan where the people could take back the power and chant and um, be elated and moved by the chanting. Wow. Yeah. yeah I, as a singer, it, mantras are really starting to resonate with me. And, and I read that they, they heal us too. Yes. And, yes. and just, I mean, I've been doing a chant to Ganesha. I kind of think of them as like love songs mm -hmm. to the quality that you want to bring into yeah. yourself too. And um, I've just found like, not only is it meditative, my teacher, my master teacher in Seattle, Tracy Weber, would talk about meditation and mantra as being like bicep curls for the brain. Mm -hmm. So you're really doing, you're doing mind training and like focusing on, you know, the words and yeah. the meaning and the symbols and, and also like the, um, the resonation like of the vocal cords, mm -hmm. like it just, it feels different than regular yeah, singing, singing to me. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. And the Sanskrit language is energy based first and language based second. So that means it's the language of our chakras. So when we chant in these, uh, in this Sanskrit language, we're activating the petals on the lotuses and it's palpable. You feel it, you feel it in your body, you feel it in your mind, you feel it in your heart. Yeah. Well, what are chakras then, for people who don't know? <laughs> chakras are energy centers. In, um, in the world of Tantra, we have three bodies, and one is an, a physical body, an energy body, and a more a subtle causal body. And so in the energy body, or that's actually called the astral body, are these rivers of energy that flow through us and around us. And there's one large river that runs along the line of the spinal column. That's the largest ridge, river. And the second and third spiral around it like the DNA, representing the opposites within us, the sun, the moon, the masculine and feminine. And where these mighty rivers cross, whirlpools of energy happen. And those are energy centers known as the chakras. They're like winning, uh, spinning disks, wheels. And they, it, it's very entailed. <laughs> wow. Well. That was just poetry flowing out of your mouth. Oh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, so one of the, my last questions before we start to talk about some of the things that you brought, um, mm -hmm. what brings you bliss in your daily life, Ms. Oh Tara? my gosh, I know that, yeah, I knew you were gonna ask. Like, um, I, uh, well, of course I love bliss. Who doesn't love bliss? Um, my children, of course, my grandchildren and my friends and um, my students teaching yoga brings me bliss. Uh, nature, of course, and music and art, and then especially my sadhana, my spiritual practice um, that I uh, devote a lot of time to, and that's where a lot of these objects are from. From my bedroom is kind of like my temple. I have altars all over my house, but my bedroom is one big altar. Mary yeah, can yeah, attest. Yeah, it's beautiful. <laughs> thank you, so beautiful. thank you. So yes, the practice of meditation, of mantras, of mudras sometimes, of what are um, mudras? Uh, sim symbols that, uh, yoga <laughs> postures of the hands, yoga <laughs> postures of the hands, a variety of different ones. Um, and asana too, of course, but a lot is cultivating the power of, um, for me, the goddess, and um, doing that also with sankalpa, which is a yogic term for an affirmation, an intention, and a resolve that kind of, it's like a personal power statement. And so for each goddess, I'll work with different goddesses for some for 40 days, some for six months, some for a couple years. I've been working with Lakshmi for a couple years, and this is not the first time to work with her. But when I do work with different archetypal energies, I'll come up with a, a power statement that encapsulates their energy, much like the mantras do, that I can affirm, not only before and after my practice, but throughout the day. So. For example, Lakshmi, the goddess, she's the golden goddess of abundance of every type. And for me, I've um, encapsulated what, sort of like uh, coming up with one word or one phrase that really sums up what she means to me. And for Lakshmi, that, that word is goodness. Mm. So my sankalpa is all around goodness. And I can share it with you if you want to hear yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely. So this is something I've been saying for a couple of years. Um, I am grateful to sit in the heart of your goodness, Ma. I am grateful to live in the heart of your goodness. I am grateful to love from the heart of your goodness. 
I am grateful to become the heart of your goodness. They say if you want to invoke Lakshmi, you must first become her. So that weaves in there too with that sankalpa. So just cultivating goodness, cultivating my connection to myself and to the, um, the feminine, the divine feminine, and to the heart of goodness. Well, you bring a lot of goodness and light to my life. Thank so you. I think you're and doing you a really mine. good job. <laughs> Thank you, Mary. Absolutely. And you to mine. Yay. Well, why don't we delve into some of the items that okay. we brought? And so part of this show, too, um, before we get to the mantra, is um, I'd like to share different people's versions of, of things that we can do in our daily lives to bring more bliss and hope mm -hmm. and, um, and yeah. peace. So... So yeah. we'll talk briefly about some of these items and then we'll chant for you in a little bit. Yeah. All right. Okay, so first we have, might as well talk about Lakshmi and Vishnu. These are murtis um, or statues. And this is a statue of Lakshmi. And many times you see her coming out of a lotus, but in this one we don't. We just see her with the lotuses in her hand. And then Vishnu is her consort and he has um, those, he's sitting on a lotus and has those beautiful snakes rising up from behind his head. Both of these two are said to be of the energy of preserving so or sustaining. In the Hindu pantheon, every god or goddess is either of a nature to create, sustain, or transform. And so these two are lovers and are of the energy of sustaining and the things that are working well for us as well as what we'd like to bring in and very much related to the heart chakra. And so we have a couple hearts made mm -hmm. out of rose quartz. And here's um, a big one and there's a double uh, rose quartz over there. And so that just, um, when we look at the uh, to gemstones um, and what they symbolize, most often the rose um, quartz is related to the heart and to love and to lovers. So my mala, my mala that I use for Lakshmi is also um, rose quartz. And uh, in the early days when I started meditating and practicing Kriya, I had one mala for all the different chants that I would do and my meditation. But as time went on and I started practicing to different deities, different mantras, different archetypal energies for longer periods of time, I would get a different mantra for each um, energy, basically especially if you're going to do it for 40 days or six, 40 days, maybe not as much, but six months or a year or two. And then the mala holds the energy. It's like prayer, prayer beads, holds the energy of that mantra, of that sankalpa, of that essence. And then when you can loan it to a friend or put it on when you're feeling down or you need to ground or you need to study. And so um, rose quartz for that mala, but you wouldn't have to have rose quartz. I just chose that. And then we have a couple lotuses because Lakshmi is said to emerge from a lotus in the seas of sort of the cosmic waters. And there's a vast long story about her creation, but she rose up from the cosmic seas in a lotus, kind of like Venus, the goddess Venus emerged from a shell. Yeah. Isn't it just beautiful? <laughs> yes. And we have an image that I think they'll show later of um, Vishnu and Lakshmi as well. Well, in the cosmic waters, actually. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much, Tara. And we'll start to chant in a little bit. But before we do, can you tell me some of your upcoming retreats or workshops? Absolutely. I'm happy to. I have to get my um, glasses and dates. Um, kind of want to, I'll tell them in order. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So up in the spring, in the summer. Exactly. Yep. So, um, on February 17th, if this is out by then, I'm doing a workshop called Self Love Sadhana. So it's a two hour workshop at the Yoga Center of Minneapolis. You can find it on their website of how to cultivate more love in your life. Um, on the path of the goddess, the more you love yourself, or the more you love the goddess is kind of like the more you love yourself, and the more you love yourself, the more you love the goddess. And it's just this big love fest, and then you love your life more. And so, anyway, just want to share about my sadhana and help folks find perhaps a self-love sadhana. Um, I do meditation teacher trainings and yen teacher trainings for the teachers out there. Those will be on my website, um, tarasindysherman.com. Amita and I will be doing um, a retreat at the Shire for the Path of the Goddess in May, May 
10th through 13th. And Coco and I will be doing a retreat with shamanism, yoga, and goddess work at the Christine Center uh, September 14th to 16th. Sweet. And then our next six-month Path of the Goddess starts in November, November 10th. This one is for women only, but we're talking about coming up with something of the Path of the Goddess or the Path of the God for men as well. So all these things will be on my website and on Yoga Center's website as well. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, what a pleasure. And thank you so much for your time and your your beautiful answers and poetry. Oh and, my gosh, yeah. thank you so much. I've, I've enjoyed being here and thank you for having me, Mayor View. My pleasure. <laughs> and we'll start chanting for you in a little bit. Thank you. All right, we're gonna chant a beautiful mantra to you about Lakshmi. Mm -hmm. Tell us about what it means, Tara. Okay, well the mantra is Om Shrim Maha Lakshmi, Om Shrim Maha Lakshmi, Lakshmi Ma 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 Ma. So Om is the mother of all mantras, and Shrim is Lakshmi's bija, her seed syllable, her encapsulated essence. Maha means great, and Lakshmi is her name. So we're just invoking and aligning and celebrating and honoring that energy of all good things. Let's do it. Okay. <laughs> Om Shri Maha Lakshmi. Om Shri Maha Lakshmi. Om Shri Maha Lakshmi. Om Shri Maha Lakshmi. Lakshmi Ma. tuning into the first episode of Imbue Your Life, Imbue Tube, as I like to call it. <laughs> Namaste, it. be well. Namaste. Thank, Thank you. you.